So, first of all, just to tell you a little bit um, about Dorothy Stopford Price, another one of the fascinating women who are associated with St. Dalton's Hospital. She came from a really interesting family. Her maternal grandfather was Avery Kennedy, who was a sometime master of the Rotunda. He was often controversial. He was always vocal, a bit like his um, granddaughter. He was a great man for the stethoscope before it was fully accepted as a useful medical device. On the other side of her family, there was a sort of an ecclesiastical lineage. Her grandfather was the Archdeacon of Meath, who was in turn the son of the Bishop of Meath. So not surprisingly, the Kennedys and the Stopfords were staunchly Protestant and loyal to the crown. Dorothy's sister, Edie, described herself and her siblings as Irish Protestant ascendancy, with both parents coming from sound settler stock. And Edie has left this memoir in the National Library in Ireland, and it makes a fascinating read about the way um, sort of upper-class Irish Protestants would have been brought up at that time. So she says, they were brought up in the true Irish Protestant social and cultural tradition, consorting only with other little Protestants. There were worries about the Stopford children picking up an Irish brogue, so they brought their governesses in from England, and their children's maids were French-speaking Swiss girls. So Dorothy began her medical studies in Trinity in 1916, and that year she spent her Easter holidays in the Phoenix Park, in the home of Sir Matthew Nathan, who was the undersecretary to the British administration at the time. And essentially, when the rising broke out that Easter, he was, um, he has been cited as the man at the wheel because the secretary was in England. So at the time, Dorothy's concerns about the rising centered around Sir Matthew Nathan, with whom she seemed to be enjoying a romantic dalliance. He was stuck in the castle. He didn't have any clothes. He need, they needed to get a suitcase into him. He had a cold. Her worries were all about what the, was happening to the British administration. However, very shortly afterwards, the aftermath of the rising with the brutal executions caused her to question her views. And very quickly, while still a medical student in Trinity, Dorothy became a nationalist. She became a member of Cumann Mon. She was a doctor to the flying column of the West Cork IRA. And then during the Civil War, um, like Kathleen Lynn, she was anti-treaty and she remained a Republican supporter for the rest of her life. But she disengaged from militant politics after the Civil War and she concentrated her energies into medicine. So from 1921, when she graduated, till 1923, she worked as a dispensary doctor in County Cork and she was working on her own, but she wanted to specialise. So she turned to St. Ultons and this was a very natural place for her to find a home. Already her great aunt, Alice Stopford Green was associated with the setting up of the hospital. She had written the introduction to the Lower Ulton, which was sold for the benefit of the hospital. And Lower Ulton, with this introduction by Alice, contained poems, drawings, and pictures by Irish artists and writers, including Jack B. Yeats, Harry Clark, Maud Gone McBride. So these were all kind of their social and cultural peers. So in 1923, Darcy was appointed to a very junior post as assistant physician in St. Dalton's Hospital. And six years later, she became a full physician in St. Dalton's. And automatically, as a full physician, she was entitled to be a member of the hospital's medical committee. And the medical committee minutes have been mentioned already. They're here in the archives. And this committee was extremely unusual in Irish medicine at the time. It comprised an elite group of politicised educated Irish women. These women essentially ran the hospital at a time when female doctors were a rarity in the profession. And obviously they were supported in an administrative role by Madeleine French Muddle, as we heard earlier this morning. The women on the medical committee were all Protestants, with the exception of Alice Barry at this stage, and this was important to the later fate of St. Ultons, as we heard from Hilary, who noted Archbishop Burns and Archbishop McQuaid's um, opposition to St. Ultons amalgamating. So essentially, the perception of it as a Protestant hospital did impact on its fate. So, what were the challenges that paediatricians faced in early 20th century Ireland? Well, Dublin in the late 1920s was a difficult place if you were poor and if you were a child. The death rate for children under the age of uh, one year was 70 in a thousand. And in June 1928, 
Doherty noted that of 179 admissions to St. Ultans, 61 died. So being admitted to hospital didn't mean that you were going to be cured and go home automatically. Now, partially this was due to St. Ultans' admission policy, which did not refuse any cases, even children who were marabond. So they admitted these children, and even though they knew they were going to die, and they provided some care for them. Of course, prior to the antibiotic watershed in the 1940s and 50s, there were few cures for infectious diseases. And hospitals sometimes contributed to the problem in that they brought infectious diseases into close proximity with each other. Other infection control issues included the fact that most hospital equipment was not single use, and this included syringes. Many vaccines against childhood illness were not available. There was smallpox, then in the 1930s, diphtheria started to come in, so, a vaccine. So what did hospitals offer at this stage? They offered children largely rest, nutrition, some therapies, and some interventions. So... Just to, to move on now to tuberculosis, which Doherty decided to specialise in in the early 1930s. And this gives us an idea of um, the way tuberculosis was playing out in Ireland. Tuberculosis was arguably Ireland's greatest public health problem in the first half of the 20th century. In most comparable countries, tuberculosis epidemics had already peaked in the 19th century, but in Ireland it was 1904 before the death rate began to fall. And as you can see from the graph, Ireland is on the top of it. We had higher annual tuberculosis um, mortality rates than England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the blip in the graph going down with the epidemic declining is due to um, World War II, and then we can just see as the antibiotics become available how the disease disappears very quickly. So to put the tuberculosis epidemic into context, from 1938 to 1949, there were 43,000 deaths from tuberculosis in Ireland. Now this is massive. It meant that everybody knew someone who was sick or ill or dying or had died from tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, then, we often think about as a chronic pulmonary disease of adults, but of course it also affected children. And non-pulmonary forms outnumbered the pulmonary forms with children. In 1922, the year the Irish independent state was formed, there were more than 600 deaths from tuberculosis among children. For much of the first half of the 20th century, tuberculosis was the third leading cause of death among Irish children, eclipsed only by gastroenteritis and pneumonia. <laughs> the disease was more prevalent in urban areas, so doctors in Dublin and in St. Ultans were dealing with children who were faced with mortality figures that far exceeded those in comparable cities like Manchester, Leeds and Copenhagen. So tuberculosis then was notoriously difficult to diagnose. Infections in children could affect all parts of the body, including bones and joints, the abdomen, membranes surrounding the brains, as well as being disseminated throughout the body in what they called a miliary form. In children, the most common symptoms were fever, abdominal pain, anorexia, and weight loss. And of course, these symptoms could have been associated with other conditions. And this quotation from the professor of medicine in Trinity in Dublin, VM Singh notes that medical students walking the wards of Dublin's hospital in the 1920s, and this would have included the doctors in St. Ultans, were confronted with cases of tuberculous glands in the neck, tuberculosis of bones and joints, tuberculous peritonitis, many of which recovered after a long illness. He, and we can say she as well, also saw numerous cases of tuberculous meningitis and miliary tuberculosis. Nothing could be done for these cases. The victim always died in a few weeks. How a child acquired tuberculous meningitis or miliary tuberculosis was obscure. Tuberculin reactions were brushed aside as unreliable, if not misleading. And matters did not improve with respect to diagnosis of tuberculosis over the next two decades. Morgan Crow, who was the deputy chief medical officer in Dublin, said that the investigation of a suspected tubercular person in Dublin prior to the 1940s was a rather haphazard affair, consisting largest, largely of stethoscopic examination, um, x-rays, tuberculin tests, etc. were not in vogue here, he said, and peculiarly enough, sputum testing seems to have been neglected. There was a lack of lab facilities. There was also a lack of x-ray facilities on, in Ireland 
prior to the 1940s. But the lack of facilities was not solely to blame. The tuberculin test, which did not require specialist equipment, was underused. So, how did the approach to tuberculosis in Chalk Ulton differ to the approach to tuberculosis elsewhere in Ireland? The answer to this seems to lie in the fact that the Irish medical profession at this stage was looking largely to England as its main influence. Chalk Ulton, on the other hand, turned its gaze towards the continent. And we've already heard about Madeleine French Mullen and Kathleen Lynn and the way that they used German between themselves as a lingua franca. Um, Dorothy Stopford also thought herself German. So on the continent, there had been develops with developments with respect to tuberculosis. In 1921, the BCG vaccine was developed in France by Calme and Garan. However, they were very good with vaccine development, but not so good with statistics. So the British slated their discovery, and the British statistician, Major Greenwood in particular, took apart their statistics perfectly correctly, in fact. Then in 1929, there was a major disaster in Lübeck in Germany, and more than 70 infants died. They were supposed to have been given BCG, but what they were actually given was a virulent lab strain of tuberculosis. But the vaccine then became tainted with this. In 1936, um, however, Dorothy visited Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and she was very impressed by what was going on there. Prior to that, she had been to Vienna, and she had done um, ward rounds with Professor Hamburger, who was using tuberculin testing. So she brought tuberculin testing back to Ireland and used it in St. Dalton's. In 1932, she'd done a postgraduate course in Scheidegg, and as I mentioned, she learned German, so she was able to tap into the German literature. In 1933, she was one of the founding members of the Irish Pediatric Club. Robert Collis, whom we also heard mentioned here, was another one of the founding members, and this brought the paediatricians together from Temple Street, Harcourt Street and St. Dalton's and provided them with the forum for discussion. In 1935, she published her um, MD on the diagnosis of primary tuberculosis of the lungs. And in that same year, she also went um, to visit Turan, Turin sorry, and Milan and did a hospital's tour. So she was fairly well um, aware of what was going on on the continent. She was very taken, as I mentioned, with the tuberculin testing. And she developed a skin test. And in the end, she had to make her own ointment because ointment became unavailable here. And she said, by means of the skin test, which takes one minute and costs one penny, primary infection can be recognized at its inception. And this um, tuberculin testing became known as the penny test because of her um, saying how little it cost to develop. So I've already mentioned many of these um, developments on the continent. And then uh, following the Lubeck disaster, Dorothy went to Norway, Sweden, and Finland, where she immediately, when she returned to Ireland, she immediately replied for a research license to use BCG vaccine in St. Dalton's Hospital. And she was successful. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. In the same year she came across a baby, baby K, in um, St. Dalton's, who died at six years of age. She, at post-mortem, took out the contents of the abdomen and the thorax, and she asked the um, pathologist, Dr. Farrington, in St. Dalton's to prepare slides. Now, they weren't experts in tuberculosis pathology, so she got in touch with Walter Padgel in, pa in Papworth. Walter Pagenl was a German Jew who was a refugee from Nazi Germany at this stage, and he was a tuberculosis, an uh, internationally recognized tuberculosis expert. She brought him over um, the slides from Baby K, and he was so impressed, he said to her, you're going to have to publish this. And she published it in the British Journal of Tuberculosis. And it was demonstrating a very rare case of congenital tuberculosis, which was heavily disputed at the time. Was there such a thing as congenital tuberculosis? And Baby K's slides, the slides of Baby K's liver, then appeared in the standard British textbook on tuberculosis for decades to come. So this was quite a significant collaboration that she started with Walter Padgel at this stage. <clears throat> 
So in 1936, then, she applies for a license, and very early in 1937, she's granted a license to experiment with BCG. But that year, there's also a vaccine disaster in Ireland, which has been forgotten, but at the time, it was um, front-page headlines in the newspapers in 1937 when it happened, in 1939 when there was a court case. And children in um, a school in Ring in County Waterford were vaccinated against diphtheria, but they ended up contracting tuberculosis and one child died. The vaccine was contaminated, we think, although there was dispute about how this actually happened, but it meant that vaccination per se started to become tainted in Ireland as well. In 1938, then, Dorothy wrote one of her seminal papers, which was about tuberculosis in infants and how healing could only be achieved in the primary stage. And in 1938, the following year, she went to Sweden. She seemed to be always on the go. And there she met Arvid Walgren, who was experimenting with BCG in Gothenburg in Sweden and achieving incredible results. And he became another important mentor to Dorothy. So this is a picture of the first license to import BCG vaccine into Ireland. It was granted to Dorothy Price of St. Ulton's Infants Hospital. And she was, it said, being a person engaged in scientific research. And it also allowed her to use the vaccine um, in other hospitals as well with the consent of the Department of Health. So she got this license in December 1936. And in January 1937, she was already importing the first batch of BCG vaccine. She brought it in from Dr. Vassen's lab in Sweden. And it was arrived two months after St. Ulton's had opened a new eight-bed dedicated tuberculosis um, unit. She only carried out a handful of, as she said herself, vaccines prior to World War II. Now, this is something that has kind of accreted layers of mythology about it as well, in the same way that Sylvie was talking about other stuff, you know, earlier about Madeleine French Mullen. And there's talk about lots and lots of vaccinations being carried out. There's talk about lots and lots of lives being saved through BCG vaccination um, at this early stage. But when Dorothy did a look back after World War II, she said she'd only vaccinated six infants. In 1942, four were alive and well and had not developed tuberculosis. A fifth could not be traced. And a sixth died from causes other than tuberculosis. However, by February 1942, Dorothy was also able to tell Arvid Walgren in Sweden that the mortality rate in St. Ulton's tuberculosis unit had reduced from a staggeringly high 77% down to what we would not consider currently an acceptable um, death rate of 28% over a five-year period. However, at the time, this was quite a significant achievement. The vaccine was not available during World War II. It was labile. It couldn't be imported. But on the 7th of May, 1945, the day before VE Day, Dorothy had been campaigning continuously for the you know, use of BCG as a mass vaccine. So, that day, St. Ulton's opened a new extension to their tuberculosis unit to promote BCG. And it was now a 30-bed unit for the treatment of tubercular children under five years of age. And she used that to get a lot of publicity in Irish newspapers about um, bringing BCG into Ireland and mass vaccination process. She again began to re-import BCG, and at this stage, she's starting to do, to do vaccinations, and we're probably moving up to the hundreds now from the handful she'd done prior to World War II. It was mainly given on an outpatient unit, on an outpatient basis, but on the 20th of June, 1949, a new um, BCG unit opened in St. Ulton's. So at this stage, St. Ulton's had grown from as we heard earlier, a two-cot hospital in 1919 to a 90-bed hospital for children up to five years of age. There were 47 cots for general medical cases up to two years, 30 cots for tubercular cases up to five years, and 13 cots for BCG vaccination. So you can see it was about half and half, a tuberculosis hospital and a general children's hospital at this stage. And although Dorothy's sort of single-minded anti-tuberculosis crusade provided St. Ulton's with excellent publicity and was a source of pride to Kathleen Lynn, there was some hostility to Dorothy's apparent desire to take over the whole hospital to treat tubercular children. <laughs> 
In effect, she seemed set on turning what was intended to be a general infants hospital into a tuberculosis hospital for advanced cases with an annex for preventive work. In 1946, Rose Doherty, a member of the medical board and future chairwoman of the hospital, pointed out that doctors working in the tuberculosis unit had access to many more beds than those working on the general staff. So, this then is a picture showing us that um, new TB extension which was put on to St. Dalton's and as we know at that stage there was a huge amount of emphasis on fresh air and sunshine and getting children outside. So earlier photographs in St. Dalton's show cots on the roof of the flat roof of the hospital. At this stage they're starting to provide balconies. So the new BCG unit, which opened in St. Dalton's in June 1949, comprised offices and committee rooms on the ground floor. There were outpatients, tuberculosis clinics. There was a new radiological department. And on the upper floor, there were the 12 cots and one isolation cubicle. The unit was praised as the best designed clinic in these islands. It was designed as a sun trap with balconies sheltered by an overhanging roof. An article in a nursing magazine enthused, the colours were all pastel and are very beautiful. One gets an extraordinary impression of light and space and complete transparency. So St. Dalton's then was to move on from treating tuberculosis within its own walls to reaching out and starting to prevent and try and prevent tuberculosis on a national level. And they were doing this through a national BCG campaign, which was rolled out from St. Dalton's. And this was something that Doherty had been fighting for for a very long time. The new Minister for Health, Noel Brown, appointed in 1948, fortuitously for Doherty, was a huge um, fan of hers, and he immediately established a National Consultative Council on Tuberculosis and appointed Doherty as its chair. In due course, a national BCG committee was put in place, and again, Doherty was appointed as its chair. She located it in St. Dalton's, and essentially, she was controlling the committee. Now, unsurprisingly, there was a certain amount of opposition from Department of Health officials. In 1989, James Deeney, who was the chief medical officer at the time in Ireland, recalled that the basic objection of the department officials to Doherty's proposals for the National BCG Committee were that we'd had enough of these independent groups floating around, each doing their own thing. For this job, we wanted a close-knit, integrated organisation. And you can see their point of view. From the department's point of view, a BCG committee, which operated outside its auspices, would be difficult to integrate into the already extant tuberculosis services. They were being required to fund with government funds a service that they could not control. Dublin Tuberculosis Service was to continue to work separately to the National Committee. However, Doherty did get her way, and she was able to establish the National BCG Committee basically with the support of Noel Brown, who was a radical himself, as we know. But political and administrative difficulties aside, any national BCG campaign established in the late 1940s would have to contend with a lot of practical difficulties. So on the grounds, the vaccine was fluid, it was perishable. Refrigerators were not readily available. They were going to have to move the vaccine around the country. Single-use needles were still not in use. Communication difficulties. Telephone system was in its infancy. Tuberculin testing had to be carried out prior to and after vaccinations. So there were a lot of visits going to have to be made to and from remote areas. So a letter from John Cowell, one of the first vaccinators, written back to Doherty in St. Dalton's, kind of captures what it was like at that stage to try and roll out a mass vaccination campaign. So I'm quoting from him now, a hasty line while the needles are boiling up for today's tour. Unfortunately, they've written to a total of 90 cases to expect us at an approximate time, a total I honestly feel we can't manage. The next day, he wrote to Doherty again and said, we've done 50 man two tests some in outlying areas, despite difficulties with the car getting stuck in the mud. So it was not easy. And when he refers to boiling up the needles, they would literally have boiled up the needles the night before, and then in between each vaccination on the day, they would dip the needle into alcohol in an attempt to sterilise it before they went on to the next vaccination. <laughs> 
So undaunted by all of these challenges, political, administrative, opposition from the Department of Health, problems with syringes, with leakage, with needles, with fridges, with telephones, with getting out there to the people. We see Dorothy and um, Kathleen Lynn smiling away. And this is one of my favorite photographs from the archives here. They both look like they are very satisfied with the way things are going at this stage in 1949. And these pictures, which are the front covers of National BCG Committee reports, which are here, and um, some of them, they're not such great quality because the reports are kind of a little bit older. You can see the corners gone and so on. But I think they capture a flavor of what it was like to roll out the National BCG campaign. So what they did was they got target groups of people together. So this is tuberculin testing at a teacher training college. And then we see that they went out to the army recruits and tuberculin tested those. This is BCG vaccination of student nurses. This is the photograph that Harriet showed earlier. As I said, it was a, a PR job for the BCG vaccination and all the nurses are dutifully smiling as they get their vaccination. And here we have um, children at Black Rock School being vaccinated. And then the other groups that they targeted included various industries. So here they are at the Sunream factory, sorry, there's a typo there, out in Balbriggan. So unfortunately for Dorothy, she had a stroke in 1950, and that ended her chairing of the National BCG Committee. But she did remain closely involved and informed about its work until 1954 when she died. In 1952, she published a survey of 10,000 tuberculin reactions based on the work of the National BCG Committee, headquartered in St. Ultans. In 1954, a posthumous publication analysed the first 140,000 um, vaccinations carried out by the committee. That same year, the year of Dorothy's death, James Deeney, who had opposed St. Ultans as the um, headquarters of the National BCG Committee, very publicly, pub publicly criticised the rate of rollout of vaccination. And his criticisms were picked up by The Lancet, which in its editorial also echoed these criticisms. There were certain issues Dorothy was a very strong controlling factor. She didn't want nurses to vaccinate. She only wanted doctors she'd personally trained to vaccinate. So there were a very small core of vaccinators. There was an early concentration on easily accessible groups. So we're talking about, um, you know, like we were looking at there, the school going population and so on, rather than neonates, which was where Dini really wanted to start it. There were definite successes achieved. Vulnerable groups like contacts were promptly vaccinated. And there were no cases, notably, of tubercular meningitis among any of those who were vaccinated. And then you also have to take into account that in addition to providing direct protection to those vaccinated, BCDG had an unquantifiable indirect effect in that it reduced the amount of infection in the environment, thereby reducing the overall risk to the population. The first decade of the BCG campaign coincided with the ending of the Irish tuberculosis epidemic, as we saw in the earlier graphs. However, it would be far too simplistic to say that bringing in a national BCG campaign um, ended the tuberculosis epidemic, because it also coincided with other interventions, like the development of effective antibiotic therapy, the provision of sufficient X-ray equipment in Ireland, Deeney's National Tuberculosis Case Finding Survey, the increased availability of hospital and sanatoria beds, better housing and better nutrition. So if we were to ask what was, to be, what was achieved by giving over the chalk or half of it to, to tuberculosis, what Dorothy and her colleagues there achieved was that they provided care for children with tuberculosis on both an inpatient and an outpatient basis. Dorothy was able to demonstrate through her various publications the decreasing death rates among the tuberculosis infants in St. Ultans prior to the antibiotic watershed. St. Ultans provided BCG vaccination for its own patient population on an inpatient and outpatient basis, so it helped to prevent tuberculosis among the population that attended the hospital. There was a huge amount of research and publications on various aspects of childhood tuberculosis. Dorothy published a book that went into a couple of editions that was on the WHO's recommended reading list with respect to childhood tuberculosis. She also published widely on the use of tuberculin testing and on BCG for prevention. There was international recognition of St. Ultans. 
For instance, the eminent Norwegian tuberculosis expert, Johannes Heinbeck, was so impressed with what was going on in St. Ultans that he personally campaigned for the BCG unit to be sited there. Dorothy and St. Ultans enjoyed collaborations with Arvid Walgren, the Swedish expert, with Walter Padgel, as I mentioned. Dorothy was corresponding member for Ireland for, on tuberculosis to the WHO. And of course, St. Ultans was the headquarters for the National BCG Committee, which rolled out its campaign from there. So that's it. <laughs>